G'day, I'm Michael Linke, Chief Executive at Recreational Aviation Australia and welcome to another in our series of learning and development videos. There are many logical procedures associated with operating an aircraft and a daily inspection is one of those. I'm with Neil Schaefer, RL's Assistant Operations Manager, to take us through it. Neil, g'day. G'day, Michael. You've been with RL's a few years now. How many years flying experience have you had? Oh, too many to count, but about 40, I guess. That's fantastic. It's so good to have people of your experience working for RL's within our membership, sharing your expertise and your knowledge. So I'm going to leave you with it. It's important that you're focused. I'm going to get to some admin and do some emails. So I'll leave you with the daily inspection. Taking over. Thanks, no Michael. Worries. Good luck. Fantastic. So, as Michael said, probably the key thing with any pre-flight or daily inspection is that we actually focus on the job at hand, so no distractions. So that's really important. The aim of the pre-flight inspection that we're going to undertake on any inspection is to determine the airworthiness of the aircraft for flight for that day. So with that in mind, we're going to have a look at the actual seg the elements and the segments that make up a successful pre-flight inspection. The first one we want to have a look at is the administration requirements of what we need to do to make sure that the aircraft is actually compliant to fly. The second point we want to look at in regards to the maintenance requirements, which can be found in the RAS technical manual, is to reference the manufacturer's pilot operating handbook. This gives us clear guidance as to what we need to do to perform the inspection. So the first part of the pre-flight inspection is to check the administration. The administration for the aircraft will determine the compliance with the manufacturer's requirements and also the time in service requirements. We're going to use a flight record sheet and every aircraft should have some form of maintenance and flight record sheet to determine that. This is the RAO's generic sheet. What we're looking for here is we're determining that the flight record sheet is for the aircraft that we're actually pre-flighting, which is Savannah 8020 in this case and we're also determining whether the aircraft is currently registered. You can see the aircraft is currently registered with our current registration um, card and it's also noted on the flight record sheet. So once we've established that the basic administration is right, we'll determine that the aircraft is within the specified time requirements designated by the manufacturer and our flight record. This can be found from the hour meter within the aircraft. Okay, so once we've determined the administration is compliant for the aircraft, we're now going to look at securing the aircraft. Now securing the aircraft is uh, a combination of a number of things, making sure we've got the aircraft in a suitable position for the pre-flight inspection, an open area with good lighting, but also making sure that we're clear of any through thoroughfare, that we're not impeding traffic, and that we are away from the public or any potential source of um, naked flame or any other threats or, or risks that we might face. So we want the aircraft in a nice open environment. Okay? If it's a windy day, we need to consider where we park the aircraft and inspect it, give consideration for the conditions, whatever they may be. Once we've done that, we're going to actually look at removing components uh, such as gust locks, security locks and so on that are associated with the pre-flight. So we're going to move in now and have a look at that. So from here we're going to remove the control locks or any associated locks for the storage of the aircraft. Freeing the controls so we can check them. Removing the throttle lock. And if fitted, we would actually apply the park brake to stop the aircraft moving during the pre-flight. We'd also make sure these ignition switches were off and we'd make sure any other electrical switches were confirmed as off to before we start the inspection. So when we start looking at the aircraft inspection, we're gonna break it down into three parts, electrical, mechanical, and chemical. The first one we're going to look at is electrical. To do that, we're going to turn the aircraft's master switch on Make sure the ignitions are switched off for security and we'll look at all the electrical systems that are fitted to an aircraft. In this case, an auxiliary electric fuel pump. We'll check its operation. We will check our strobe lights. We will check our landing light. Stall warning or stall horn, if it was fitted, we would check. We would also check electric flaps and check the operation of the flap mechanism if fitted. 
We would then move across and check the voltmeter, ensure there was a voltage supply, which clearly we have. We would have a generator light on because we're not generating current at this stage, and we would check any other warning lights or alarms fitted to the aircraft. Having checked all the electrical systems, we now need to make the aircraft safe by turning off the master key, ensuring the switches again are off, removing the key if fitted, and putting it in a clearly visible spot so that we can determine the aircraft is safe for the actual walk around. So first of all, we talked about the electrical, mechanical, and chemical components of the pre-flight. We're going to have a look at the mechanical parts of the pre-flight now, and we're gonna break it up into engine and airframe. Both of these have got chemical components. The engine, we have coolant and oil, and in the, fuel, in the chemical component for the airframe, we actually have to check, of course, the fuel. So let's start with the fuel first. So we talked about conducting the fuel tech first. So in order to do that, we need a dipstick. Somebody said they needed a dipstick. We've got a dipstick. Ah, oh, thanks, Michael. <laughs> so here we have a calibrated dipstick. We're going to now use that to actually check the quantity of our fuel. Now for a daily inspection, it's really important we do a number of checks. It's no good just relying on electrical or other um, sighting gauges to determine the fuel quantity. There's some other reasons why we actually need to actually get involved and take a closer look. So follow me up the ladder. We'll apply normal workplace health and safety considerations. Catch me if I fall. And we'll have a look at our fuel system. Clearly, we need to unscrew the fuel cap. In doing so, we're actually able to check the venting system. If we hear a hiss, it indicates that we've got a blockage in the venting system. This is one critical reason why we need to physically remove the caps as part of a daily inspection, but it's also good practice for any pre-flight. Having done that, we can now use our calibrated dipstick to work out how much fuel is available in this tank. Being careful not to drop the dipstick, we do a quick check and confirm that there was 20 litres of fuel available in that side, and we would note that in our flight record if required. When we put the cap back on, we look to determine if there were any O-rings there and determine the integrity of those as part of the sealing system and we would return the fuel cap, not over tightening it, but turning it in a position where it's firm. Walking back down now, we would check the vent, and in the Savannah aircraft, we've got a vent that faces forward to create positive pressure for the venting of the, air, of the fuel. That would complete that fuel check on that tank. So clearly we need to apply some basic principles we talked about earlier. We are gonna get the three Cs. In this case, it's not correct operation, it's correct quantity condition of the fuel system and the cap, and change. Is there anything that's not integrated or is, is, is basically degraded from an acceptable standard? So we'd apply that fuel check and we do that if we had to with an auxiliary tank or the other main tank as part of our chemical fuel check. Okay, so we've checked now fuel quantity, but well, we've got other things to do with fuel as well, and they'll be completed as part of our fuel check on this pre-flight inspection. So we've talked about fuel quantity. The next thing we have to talk about in our inspection is fuel quality. Yes, I know we can get bad fuel at bad places, but let's have a look what's in our aeroplane today. So for fuel quality, we need to do a fuel drain check. So we're gonna do that now. On the Savannah, the fuel drain is located in a small reservoir, which we have access to underneath. Some aircraft you'll find it's up near the engine bay. But we need, tend to use a reasonably good quality fuel testing device, and where we can actually clearly see some conditions that we're going to talk about in fuel. So let's grab a sample. So here we've got our fuel sample straight out of the aircraft. What are we looking for with a fuel sample in, the, in, in our aircraft? Well, again, this C concept keeps coming up. We're checking things. So colour. Is it the appropriate colour for the type of fuel? Basically, a yellow blend will be an unleaded. A blue would be an avgas. And if it's anything coloured other than the standard colours that are recommended for aircraft, we'd want to know why. So colour is the first thing. The next thing is clarity. Have we got a clear sample of fuel? And if it isn't clear, what's making it unclear? Is it mixed? Is it contaminated with um, foreign matter in it? We need to identify that it's a clear and uncontaminated sample. Sometimes we might have to shake the sample. 
We'll have a look at what water in a fuel looks like in a moment. But most good quality fuel testing gauges have got a prism that actually expands it so we can actually see if there's any contamination. So it's important to move it and look at the fuel sample and determine whether or not we've got any issues with the fuel supply we've just tested. Keeping in mind that we've tested our fuel drain which is at the lowest point of the fuel system and water being heavier than fuel will be caught first. That's the principle anyway, so let's hope it works. Okay, so we've taken our fuel sample. If you remember, we looked at a sample that was about that level before, but we need to look for separation. Now this fuel sample, I don't know whether you can see that or not, but we've actually got a suspension layer. Water being heavier than fuel is now sitting at the bottom of our test sample. Sometimes difficult to see, particularly if it's not a large amount like I've shown here. Really important that we take the time to actually check the fuel sample and make sure it's okay. This is why we don't use additive based fuels that have got ethanol in them because they actually hide the water. They become what we call hygroscopic. They absorb the water. So this is why it's important in unleaded aircraft we use a 95 leaded fuel or a premium grade fuel so that we don't get ethanol in our fuel because it hides this picture that we need to see. So sometimes it might be mixed together and it might be hard to see that separation. So we actually need to move the sample to see that there's a definite barrier line, a meniscus as it were, that shows the water and the fuel. That's gonna make your engine stop right there. So one last point on water contamination in our fuel sample. Sometimes we can look at a sample and it can actually all be the same, but guess what? It's all water. So it's really important that when we take a sample, we take a good sample, we move it around because it's very easy to see one color or one clarity, but it could all be water. What do we do if we find water in the fuel? Don't just take a few drains and think it's gonna go away. We need to find the cause of that problem and remove the fuel before we do anything else. We ain't flying this aeroplane with that water in the fuel system. It's caused a number of accidents in recreational aircraft over a number of years. So okay, it's time to get our walking shoes on and get our eyes open. We're now gonna walk around the aircraft. Now just a note on the walk around process. Everyone's got a different viewpoint about where you start and where you finish. It doesn't really matter. Some people will start at the door when they finish security and administration. Some people will start at the propeller. It doesn't really matter as long as whatever we do, we apply consistently and we do and we build a consistent habit. Likewise, it doesn't matter whether you go clockwise or anti-clockwise. Different hemisphere, upside down, no one cares. As long as it's consistently applied. So that's just the first note. I like to start at the spinner. So I'm gonna start at the spinner of the aircraft. I just wanna step back and just talk about this principle, this philosophy of checking. We talked about the three C's. Correct operation, condition, and change. Well, this is where we get that hat on and we start looking at things closely. So, is the spinner correctly assembled? Are all the fixing screws in appropriately and tight? And we will get down, and this is where we get active and look around. We'll look for cracks, that is condition, and we'll look to say, oh, there was a little crack there last week and it looks like it's grown and it's moving out. That's change. So we need to think about this. And if we're not sure, what are we gonna do? Go and ask our qualified maintenance go-to person. So, we start with the spinner. We have a look at that. Really important we don't push on these things because while they're strong in one direction with airflow, they're not designed to be pushed on, especially by big beefy guys. Then we're gonna have a look at our propeller blades. Again, correct operation and assembly. We might notice the pitch is out. Condition. You'll see in here there's a bit of milking that we've spoke to, but these are the sort of things spoken to um, the manufacturer about, they don't have a problem with, but we look for change in that and see if it's getting worse and if it's causing things like delamination in a composite material. We can have a look at the hub pinch blocks, but as part of our pre-flight inspection and daily inspection, we wouldn't remove the spinner. That's something our engineers or our maintenance people will do as part of the regular interval servicing for that aircraft, depending on the manufacturer's pilot operating handbook. Okay, so from this point here, we've got an opportunity to check a number of other aspects as well. 
we can look inside the air intakes and we can have a bit of a look at the exhaust headers. We can look for correct operation and assembly, condition and change. Again, is there any oil, obviously, in the belly pan? Is there any debris that's got in there? Gosh, I almost hit that bird last week. Now I know where he went. Okay, and we might look down here at our oil cooler and our radiator. And being careful, sometimes it's a good idea to just run your flat hand across these to make sure if there's any wetness, because you may not always see that leak. So we're gonna check those, make sure they're intact, make sure that there's no leakage or contamination or even debris. It's often you get a lot of grass in here and something you don't want to have a clogged up radiator. Not going to help your engine cooling at all. So from here we can move downwards and we can actually get down lower and actually have a look at our nose leg assembly. So now we're down at the nose leg, we're starting to look at the undercarriage. Our undercarriage takes a fair bit of a hammering, some more than others, right? So what we're going to have a look at is some of the things. Again, we're going to apply that 3C principle and we're going to have a look at the nose leg. We're going to start from the ground up. The tyre. Is it the appropriate tyre for the aircraft? Are there any nicks, damage? Is it inflated? And you might want to want a daily inspection, grab your tyre pressure gauge and check it meets the manufacturer's standard for tyre pressure. Can't always see. Kicking the tyres doesn't always help. But let's have a look at the condition and any change. You'll notice we've got some balance weights on the wheel here, make sure they're fixed. And then we'll work up through the axle spindle. We'll look at the actual arm. We'll look for any cracks or damage or bending. We'll move up to the welded plate and we'll work our way systematically, looking for correct operation. You'll notice the bolts, condition and change. You'll see here we've got a bump stop. We'll work our way up to where our lubricated bush is. We'll check our bush and we'll feel for any free play. Some free play is acceptable, again, if you're not sure, confer with your maintenance specialist. While we're down here, we can have a look at our fuel line that feeds up. In this case, the Savannah has an external fuel line. We're looking for the rubber and we're going to squeeze the rubber and see that it's okay. Don't just look at it, get, get active and feel. Look for your connections and again, feel for any fluids that may not be visible and we're feeling to see if there's any fuel. You may see a brown stain, which could indicate a problem, and that's worth investigating further. Also, we're down here, we might have a look at the exhaust and make sure the exhaust, be mindful if you're doing that on a pre-flight that it could be hot. So this is why it's good to do this as part of a daily inspection. Also, you can see our exhaust up here, and you can see our scat hose. Again, detailed inspection, have a close look, apply the three C's, and once satisfied, move on. If there's any doubt, consult. So while we're looking at our undercarriage, we'll go and have a look at our main wheels as well. In this side here, we're looking at the port side or the left side main wheel. Again, start with the same concept from the ground up. Tire, correct operation and assembly, condition and change. Nicks anything buried in there. Have a look at the tread condition and the tread wear pattern because it could indicate a further issue as to terms of the undercarriage and how it's working over the time. Have a look at our main axle, our main hub bolts and make sure that any securing mechanisms for our axles have been safety locked or safety tabbed as per here. Valve caps should be on all tubes and just have a general look at this tyre. Again, we might want to check the tyre pressure, make sure we adhere to the manufacturer's requirements for minimum tyre pressures. While we're down here looking at the wheel, we need to look at the other side. So we need to come around and have a look at the disc brake. We need to look at the rotor itself, determine condition, change, and make sure some are floating, some aren't. This is a solid disc with a floating caliper. We'll have a look at the brake line because it's got chemical fluids inside it and we'll again check that for correct operation. Make sure that the securing attachment points are fine. We've got can see fluid in here and make sure that there's no leaks. Following that down, we'll actually have a look at the caliper itself and check the condition of the brake pads. We should be looking for uneven wear, any cracking and have a look and how far the piston is extended. That'll give you a bit of an idea of the wear that's occurring with your disc. 
pad and how it's progressing over time. Again, it's a change response to have a look at how much it's changing. This is a great spot for water to start corrosion and this is where we can get leaks. So that's really important to look. Again, have a look at the inside axle fixing point, any other bolt fixing points, and possibly move the wheel to determine the wheel bearing integrity and make sure that we haven't got loose wheel bearings. If you've got room and the aircraft's secured, you, you could unbrake it and check rolling, but you're gonna pick that up. But I always like to feel a bit of free play. The final check when we're down here, moving up from the actual wheel, is to check the undercarriage attachments. Again, they cop a fair flogging, particularly on rough airstrips. Here we've got some bumper lustomas, we've got bolts that hold them in. It's really important when we talk about bolts, we have a talk about what happens to bolts. The typical problem is necking, where we start to see fatigue. So we need to have a look at the integrity of the bolt as it distributes a load across this flat plate. So we're looking to see that it's threaded. We haven't lost any nuts off here. So correctly assembled, again, in appropriate condition, no fatigue or necking or anything that indicates a failure. And has it changed since the last time we looked at it? Likewise, the undercarriage legs. These are nice sprung metal legs. They're wonderful. But on a composite leg, we might actually have some delamination. So really important, depending on your aircraft type material, that you know how to assess whether it's tube, solid or composite will determine the type of things you need to be on the lookout for. One I'll check I do here is just use my foot as a bit of a chock and I check for the free play. And we want to make sure that it's acceptable, that we're not getting too much rocking, that the movement is working against the bump stop effectively. Really important to do that on all undercarriage legs. Okay, that's a change item that you will see. They'll loosen up over time. This aircraft's done nearly two and a half thousand landings, so we keep a pretty close eye on it. So we're gonna have a look at our metal wing, part of our airframe, and we're gonna talk about metal airframe in this case. Again, it'll be different for composite and fabric. Clearly we've got the Dino section, the leading edge of the airfoil. We've got securing structures, which are our ribs and our rivets and we've got any flush covers or attachments that form part of that, that, that bond it to the fuselage. Okay, again, correct operating, condition and change. In a metal aircraft, it's really important to look at the bonding process that's applied. Normally through rivets, can be screws. Some are pop, some are flush mount. We're looking for signs of looseness, defined by a black ring around the rivet. That indicates a working rivet. A working rivet means that we've got movement between the inter integral structure, which can be a problem and may need to be investigated further. They often call them smoking rivets. So we'll have a look at our rivet line, make sure there are none missing. We'll feel to see that there's no free play between the rivet and the rib and the actual leading edge surface. And we'll work our way along looking and feeling to see that we haven't had some sort of strike or, or, or compromised integrity for this structure. So we're going to follow us along our wing. You'll notice that this aircraft is fitted with plastic VGs. Okay, VGs are basically vortex generators. Uh, won't go into their function. That's a good lesson for you to go and look up in BAK and see how VGs work. But if they're fitted to the aircraft, you'll see here that we've got a broken one. UV gets to these suckers really easily and it's acceptable to have some broken ones, but again, check with your manufacturer's POH to see what's an accept acceptable limit and loss for any of the tabs. As we move along, we're gonna check our strut, our jury strut. So you'll see we're working on a high wing aircraft here today and it's not always possible to see over the top of the wing. That's easier in a low wing, but then we're gonna get underneath it. So depending on the wing plan form, we're gonna have to either get down or get up. So it's worthwhile at some point in the inspection, if you can't see the whole wing plan, to actually get up and take a closer look from maybe on top, and certainly on a low wing, get underneath. Really important. So again, the, the integrity and the smoothness of the leading edge, this is where our airflow separates. This is our lift. If we've got a lot of damage on this leading edge, hail damage or what on, that's gonna affect the performance of the aircraft, okay? So that's going to affect our leaf production, could change our stall characteristics or even our stall speed. So it's a really important thing to take a look at and don't just take a, oh, she'll be right. Even little things like making sure it's clean. 
the glider guys, they'll tell you all about keeping clean leaning edges and clean wings. But for us, we'll punch the bugs and smash them out of the way. Okay, we come to our pedo system. You'll see we already removed the cover as part of our removal of locks, covers and so on. Some people leave them on until they get to this point. We've taken them off as part of a removal of covers process. We're going to follow through, having a look to see that it's clear. We don't want to tap or push on this or blow in it because it can affect the very sensitive um, um, bellows and systems within the actual instrument itself. But we do need to look at the integrity of the pedo. Sometimes there'll be a static vent associated with these as well. In this case, the static system has been plumbed in separately. We follow it back through around the bend, looking for integrity where it's connected to the polyurethane piping and the plumbing that goes down through the strut down into the cabin. Okay, again looking for where that's fixed. This is a good one if you've been at your air show on a pre-flight inspection. Somebody well-meaning comes along, particularly where it sticks out and bumps this, you get a right angle pedo. Not much good for reading airspeed. So really important to check this if you've been away from your aircraft as part of your pre-flight inspection. Final round on pedos. People aren't always in the habit of putting their pedo covers back on and sometimes in a hangar they don't actually use a pedo cover. I can tell you, get a pedo cover. It only takes a wasp 20 minutes to build a nest in there. So what we need to do is make sure that there's been nobody building nests in there. Particularly in certain climates and environments, it's more common than others. But when you're having a look, look for signs of it. And if you're in one of those areas, call a flick man, but watch out and get your pedo cover on. So we're moving out along our wing and you'll notice this is where a bird striker occurred. I've got a really good sheet metal Amy here and he did a wonderful job on fixing us up. But you can see there's a bit of dimpling in there and there was a little bit of cracking of the paint. So that's a change item. I'm looking at that and if I saw that corroding or if I saw that extending, that's definitely something I'd want to be on top of. So I know about this aircraft, but on any aircraft if we see change, especially if there's been a stress event, monitor it and always check with a specialist if you're not sure. Moving out to the wingtip, we can see the beautiful shape of a stole high lift wing. You'll see we've got a strobe light attached here. We've already checked those before if you recall. What we're going to do is look along and take a big picture view of the leading edge. So we can have a look. There's not much dihedral on this aircraft, but that's normal. And we've got the opportunity to just rock the wing gently. If we listen carefully, we might hear the fuel in the wing tanks, but we can actually listen to the undercarriage and see if there's any grinding or cranking or something that would suggest through sound that there's maybe some movement in there that we haven't picked up. What are we going to do if we hear something that doesn't sound right? We're going to take a closer look. Following our rivets, there's an inspection port we use for putting in some anti-corrosive, so we check that that little plug's in. We're going to follow our rivet line down and move to the trailing edge of our wing. Okay, so we're now at the trailing edge of the wing. We're getting to the business end of one of the control surfaces of the aircraft. This, technically, at this part is called the aileron but on the Savannah, it's actually a flapper on. It basically covers the whole length of the wing as one moving surface. If you take a look inside the cabin, you should be able to see the control moving. I have a really simple check for checking the correct sense of movement. If I had my thumb on that control column and I pushed that up, it would be thumbs up. Guess what? It's hooked up the right way. Trust me, all you amateur builders, make sure your ailerons are first configured before you st start test flying. Really easy to cross the connectors over. So, correct orientation, full and free movement. We're feeling for any compromise in the movement, any notchiness. And because this full span flapper on has to move, there's brass bushes in here where they're attached at this attachment point. There will be some free play. You can see that there. That's what we've got to have because as this wing takes load, it will stretch and we need to have it so it doesn't bind. But there is a limit to how much free play there should be on any control surface. Otherwise, if it's beyond that, we can have a control flutter issue. Again, refer to a specialist if you're not sure. You'll see here we have a castellated nut. This is one type of fixing system that's used on aircraft. You can have nylock nuts or you can actually have other friction based nut systems. The castellated nut has a split pin going through a castle to lock it in there. 
It's important that these get changed at whenever there's a maintenance inspection on a control surface, that we've got the split pin in place, we've got the castellated nut in place, and I like to see what we can actually turn the assembly because that determines it's not too tight or we're not binding with some corrosion. Really important to check those three things. So again, correct operation, condition, and has it changed? So welcome to the pilot shade room. About the only shade you get in summer in Australia, sometimes under your wing, but guess what? We make the most of it and in rain too. So it's important to get underneath your wing. There's a few things we need to look at under here. Water's heavy, we need to look for drain holes. So if we've got any drain holes in the aircraft, like here, we should be looking to see that they're unobscured. Generally, you'll find with a wing shape, the drain holes will be at the back. Check your drain holes. Check your vents again. We talked about that earlier, but have a look at your vents as well. Have a look at your rivets, of course. And of course, if there's any rock damage from your undercarriage, guess where it's gonna hit first? Under surface of your wing particularly on low wing aircraft and the, and the flaps, really important that we check those control surfaces because they're likely to be damaged and because they're closest to the ground and where all the rocks are. Also really important we're under here, check our registration numbers, they're okay. If you have a look here, we've got our inspection covers. This one here is actually fixed with normal machine screws and star washers. Make sure that they're all fixed in place, that somebody hasn't left it off as part of a previous inspection and make sure it's secured, okay? Correct operation and assembly, got it. So we talked before about the fuel system and any uh, appropriate um, seal, seals that are in there and, and, um, uh, and, and checking the integrity of the sealing. You'll see here there's some staining, probably just because it was overfilled, but if we see a constant stream here, it might be go worthwhile going back and having a look, particularly if it's changed or there's significantly more than the last time you inspected it. Again, if you're not sure, ask your CFI or your maintenance specialist. But good to look for that. We can also have a look at the rest of our rivets, working our way up and looking at the general shape of the wing and also looking at the surface skin and making sure that there's nothing in there that would suggest there's been some stressing of the airframe in a previous flight. And then we finish off, again, following the same process, looking at all our connection points, checking our control right until we work to the root of the wing where we actually identify the fixing point where the torque tubes are connected. Here's an important one. We've talked about the pitot. All you pilots out there will know that the pitot pressure is only one thing, that's a dynamic pressure. We also have to know about the static pressure. This is the static port. There's two on the Savannah. Know where your static ports are and check them. If you ever wash your airplane, good idea to cover them up, but please don't forget to take it off. It's pretty embarrassing if you don't have static pressure. It can ruin your pressure day. While we move along the fuselage, again we're looking for correct operation and condition. We check any antennas or aerials. We'll see we've got a fuel overflow here and a battery overflow as well. So if we've got any overflows or vents, we'll check those. And you'll see there's a large inspection cover under there. Any inspection covers, check they're all fully fastened and secured. Again, we've got our VHF antenna, we'll check that. Make sure it's okay. If you see corrosion, this is a common point to find corrosion on metal aircraft because you get an electro electrostatic reaction between the antenna and the ground plane. Really important that you have a look at that. That's a good point. And again, we'll have a look at our turtle deck, have a look at our, um, our perspex or Lexan, make sure it's, in, it's, it's, it's secured, it's in a good condition. You see we've got a little vent here that equalizes the cabin pressure. Make sure nobody has stuffed a rag in there or something like that. We'll work our way along through the empennage of the aircraft, again looking at all the rivets, making sure that they're not working, making sure that they're all fixed and there are none missing. And we'll follow those down systematically working our way to another inspection cover. And then we're going to start talking about cables. I'm going to stay down here for a moment and I want to talk about cables. A lot of our aircraft systems are cable operated. It's really important to understand cables. This is where and we can have a rag or some sort of material. If you use your hand, we're looking for broken strands in the wire. Now, a stranded wire cable derives all its strength from the total number of strands working together to provide integrity. If one snaps on the outside, that means that there could be others snapped inside. So we're going to look and check, and it's good to grab a little bit of silk cloth or something, and you'll feel it straight away. 
you won't always see it. The other thing is where they cross a point, look for shiny flat surfaces where there's a wear point because that can actually affect the integrity of the cable. Follow that back up to the swage. Make sure the swage is integral, there's no corrosion where there's water been getting into the swage. And we're gonna check again the castellated nut. There's an adjustable arm here and connector here with a castellated nut right down to the actual rudder horn where we check this. This is where all the load is transferred in the rudder and it's really important to look. You'll see it's pretty beefy on this aircraft and you'll find most aircraft are the same. Okay, while we're under here, we're gonna have a look at the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator assembly. Okay, someone once said, if you had to lose the control out of the three, which one would you hate to lose? Well, I don't wanna lose any of them, but if I'm gonna lose any, I don't wanna lose the elevator. If I've got the elevator, I might be able to do something anyway. This is a pretty substantial bracket here. So again, this is really important. We wanna check the rivets. Sometimes you can think it's a smoking rivet. Just rub your fingernail around the edge of it and you might find it's just a bit of wax. This plane gets pretty loved and gets a lot of wax on it to keep it nice and protected. And sometimes the wax will build up around the head. But if you see something that looks like a real working rivet, rivet go and check it. Find out, if you're not sure, ask. You'll see a tail skid down here tail skid we shouldn't be hitting but it's a good idea particularly if the aircraft's been flown by other people um, and you're not the only one flying it check the tail skid if the aircraft's had a tail strike that could indicate a whole bunch of other issues in the airframe that you might need to check so have a look at any tail skid um, if it's a tail wheel aircraft again have a look at your tail wheel and check out the integrity of a tail wheel really good and a really hard point of contact for some aircraft particularly tail wheels so this leads us to our elevator. So attached to the horizontal stabiliser is our elevator, okay? This is the trim tab. Some trim tabs are actually just basically um, servo assisted, some are anti-servo. This one here you'll see moves as I move the elevator. So it's got an anti-servo arm up through here. So the great way to determine the integrity of the trim on a servo system is move the elevator through the range of movement and see that the trim tab is moving. On a, on a, on a non-anti-servo system, that won't happen. Okay, so again, there's a connection point for this cover, for this nacelle, we check that. We've got a tie rod connection here. We're gonna check that and make sure there's no free play, but make sure the actual tie rod can move on its own. Really important. We're gonna follow that down and actually have a look to where it comes through to the back of the trim arm. And there's a little servo motor up in there that we can't see but we check that and we check the trim as part of our pre-takeoff check. Again, we've got hinges both in the elevator and on the trim tab. This movement sideways is acceptable within limits, but vertical movement that would allow some propagation of flutter would not be acceptable. You'll notice this one here, they're not painted rivets. These ones were replaced not too long ago because there was excessive movement in the hinge. So the pins were replaced. So that's part of that monitoring process. Okay, so that's the elevator. Again, we're looking for full, free, and movement in correct sense. If you have a friend, you can check the elevator, or you might be able to sneak your head around and see the control column moving if you're lucky. So now we're gonna move around to the vertical stabilizer. That's this part here, and we're gonna move on to the rudder, okay? Basically, our vertical stabilizer, it's got a cover that attaches here. We'll see the rivets. It's a solid structure. This main spar is really important. In some aircraft, if this isn't quite strong and the aircraft side slipped a, a lot, particularly a, a stall type aeroplane with a lot of side slipping going on, it puts a lot of stress on this stringer. And you can actually see, if you're not careful, there could be cracking developing in some of the points where it flexes. So this is a really important point, much like your elevator. There's a lot of force here on this part of the aircraft. There's a lot of moment forces because we're a fair way back from the center of gravity. It's really important to check that the integrity of structure is here. Again, condition, change, and correctly operating all our bolts are in place. You can just see in here our turnbuckles or our connection points with our elevator horn. And again, we move through that and when we come to the other side, you'll see it more clearly. You'll see there's an elevator stop point here. It's good to check that and make sure it's in place. Sometimes if people drop the controls, you can actually bend or break or damage the, um, the elevator stop or the control stop. And I've actually seen control stop things broken and sitting loose inside the rear of the aircraft. Any fixed trim tabs, 
on our on our rudder or any of our control services we should check you'll see this has got an offset that's holding in a bit of right rudder that's overcoming the slipstream at normal cruise so our rudder would normally be sitting like that it means that we're not sitting there resting our right foot on the rudder so you'll see here we've got a an adjustment tab on the rudder okay you'll see it's bent here and it's got holes they've lightened that off but obviously it's easy to get bumped so we want to have a look see it's got a consistent bend in it see that there's no cracking and um, you can see in this case there's a bit of an offset to left that's applying a little bit of right rudder force which is overcoming our slipstream so that's what you'd expect very unlikely you'd expect to see it bent the other way so know which way it should be bent have a look at it and if it's changed hey who's bumped it why is it changed was it noted okay again we're going to check rivets we're going to check integrity of the skin we could tap on any of the surfaces to see if there's been any separation also really important percussion techniques can be used on composite but i won't go into composites it's a complex area but knowing how to check for bonding and integrity and delamination in composites as composite materials is important likewise with fabric we've got other things we need to look at as well so look, we're at about the halfway point in terms of the airframe now. So everything I've explained to you, I hope you've got. I'm sure you'll have questions and you can refer to our website or any wraps we put out will give you some more guidance on the pre-flight inspection. But what we're going to repeat on this side of the aircraft is no different to what we've just got shown you through on the other side. If there's anything different on one side of the aircraft, we'll give that special attention. But we're going to follow through working around in a systematic pattern, checking all the things we've checked back around from the other side of the aircraft, working our way all the way, taking our time to check individual item based on the three C's, correctly operating and assembled, the condition and any change we might have observed. We're gonna work our way all the way around the aircraft, taking our time, looking and taking a long view. So we see a big picture of things like the wing, checking our undercarriage again, working our way right back around to the front of the aircraft and if you remember we started at the spinner and we're going to finish at the spinner so we're going to work around here we'll check our fasteners we're going to have a look at our engine separately in this inspection but if we'd finish that we would make sure all our fasteners were in place our cows were secured and that we hadn't left any tools on the aircraft when we come back around to the front this is a really good time to stop and admire a thing of beauty some don't think the savannah is but i think they're wrong but we're going to step and take in the big picture. We've had a look at the small detail of every part of the aircraft. We're now going to step back and look for symmetry of the undercarriage legs. Look for anything that suggests we've got something that we didn't see up close. We're going to see if we left any rags or our fuel dipstick up on top. And anything else that might catch our broader view by stepping back away from the aircraft. And that completes the pre-flight. Let's go and have a look at the engine now. Okay, we're going to talk about the engine, but I want to talk about removing covers. It's really important that we use the right tool, or if we've got a tool that's a standard tool, we actually think about the aircraft. It's really important when we remove some of the fixing screws, you'll find a lot of the things are Zeus fasteners or quarter turn connectors. When we do it, we should put our hand underneath the actual fastener, put our blade of our instrument on there, put our thumb over the top and turn it to release it. That way we're not likely to slide off and scratch the material. Really basic habit of capturing the nut and making sure we're controlling the movement. Then when we do that, it's just a simple matter of removing the Zeus fastener and we haven't damaged the aeroplane. If it's yours, it's your pride and joy. If it's somebody else's, they're not gonna be happy. So really important to make sure we don't go nuts about nuts. So we're going to remove the cow now to do our engine bay inspection. We're going to check the mechanical parts that relates to the engine. It's a whole subset of the inspection and it's an important part. You might choose to do it first as part of your pre-flight or you might do it later. It's entirely up to you. I tend to do it first. Okay, so we're going to pull the cow off so we can actually do an inspection. Our aircraft manufacturer will dictate whether the cow should be removed for a pre-flight inspection or a daily. The daily and the pre-flight may be different. So you need to consult with your manufacturer's operating handbook as to removal of cows. Okay, we're gonna take the cow off here. And when we take our cow off, 
We're not going to leave it around to get damaged because this is probably worth about three or four thousand dollars. We're going to put it in a nice secure spot where it's not going to get damaged or blown away. And we'll move it well clear of the inspection. I'll be back in half an hour. Okay, so here we are in the engine bay, the heart of the matter you might say. We're just a glider without an engine. So really important that we spend a lot of time on the engine. And there's a bunch of things to check in here. Okay, again, we're gonna apply the same principles, correct operation and assembly, the conditions appropriate for the aircraft or any of the components, and have we noticed any change? Every engine's gonna have unique things that we need to check, okay? There's a chemical component to our engine check as well, where we're gonna talk about fluids. In the case of the Rotax, we're gonna have a coolant because it's a water-cooled engine, and we're gonna have our oil, okay? We may have propeller systems that have got some form of hydraulic fluid, and in some of our direct drive engines that are air-cooled, we won't have radiators and coolant, coolant and other fluids, okay? But there could be another things. Just be mind, first thing is if this is a pre-flight and the aircraft has flown before, things could be hot in here. So think about safety, think about whether you want to wear some sort of protective gloves, okay? But if it's a daily inspection, the first flight of the day, we're assuming the engine's cold, and that's going to be a great chance to get in, get our hands dirty, and have a really close look at all the components of the engine. So that's just a start on the engine, okay? We've got a Rotax 912 engine in this aircraft, pretty standard. This and the Jabiru engine form the majority of the power plants in recreational aircraft. This is a gearbox reduction drive engine, okay? So the first thing to understand is what is part of the engine. We've got a number of components. We've got a electrical system. We've got a oil distribution system. We've got a cooling system. And we have, in this case, we have a reduction drive system as well. And of course, there's the fuel system, which delivers fuel to the engine. So each of these systems are all part of the overall engine. That's over and above just the engine itself, which is creating the propulsion. So we're gonna have a look at these systems and we're systematically gonna work our way through the engine. So I like fuel is first. We'll check fuel, so we'll check our fuel system. Our fuel comes from our wing tanks, feeds its way down through the firewall, and it actually comes in through a series of filters. Remember we checked it earlier when we were underneath the aircraft? Well, guess what? We get to a point here where we come to our second filters. So with fuel, we're checking the integrity of the lines. You'll see these have got fireproof coating on them. So we can't see the line, but we need to feel the line and feel that they're malleable and that they're rubbery. We don't want them solid. If they're solid and we can't move them, that's one of the first tests of any, any hose that's carrying a fluid. Remember, it gets hot and gets cold in here. The cycling on plastics and rubbers affects their integrity. Just because it's a five year replacement, you might find that you might have to replace these every two years or sooner, depending on the conditions you're operating in. Harsh environments are harsh on materials. So you need to think about that in terms of your own aircraft or the aircraft that you're pre-flighting. Okay, so we're gonna follow our fuel system in a systematic way. To do that, you need to know how the fuel delivery system works in an aircraft. So if this is too hard, probably time to go off and get the books and learn about fuel delivery. Ask your CFI or your maintenance specialist. So we come up here to the fuel, it splits. We split between the left-hand carburetor and the right-hand carburetor. Some aircraft are fuel injected these days, becoming increasingly popular. Carburetors don't exist anymore. But good old Rotax has got the Bing 54. It's been a, well tr it's been a trusted altitude compensating carburetor for a long time. So, Fuel gets delivered to the carburetor, okay? It actually comes up as well. We've got our mechanical fuel pump. Important on the Rotax to make sure it's not the actual um, pressed metal version, which is replaced by a service bulletin, and it's actually the, the new cast system. These were pretty much standard from 2012 onwards, okay? So know the service bulletins that apply to your engine manufacturer, whether it's Jabiru, Rotax, Subaru, whatever your power plant is. Know the service bulletins, be familiar with them. Okay, so we check our fuel, mechanical driven fuel pump, which is driven off the gearbox. Again, we check the hoses, the clamps. We're looking for correct operation and assembly, in this case, assembly predominantly, condition and change. And condition includes fuel leaks. We're looking for anything that suggests fluid is not where it should be. And we're looking and feeling. And, and we don't want to get aggressive in here, but pushing a fuel line is like massaging the motor and saying, I'm here, okay? 
So we're gonna go through that fuel system and we're gonna check it on both sides. So on this side here, we're gonna look at the fuel, the filter, fil know when your filters should be replaced and know where contamination, if it gets past the fuel tank, it can get into the fuel filter. Block fuel filters are a prominent, prominent cause of engine failures and engine starvation through fuel starvation. Okay, in the Rotax, there's, there's a number of current advisories out for the Rotax, and particularly the carburetor one is the float bowls. Know what the status is of the float bowl, of, of any service bulletins, as I said before, particularly on the Rotax, understand about the float bowls. Um, you won't detect it from looking at it, you've got to go through the service bulletin and know what to check and how to check them as part of your ongoing maintenance schedule. So we check our carburetors, we check the boots into the intake manifold. So fuel comes in, gets supplied to the carburetor, it mixes fuel and air. So let's have a look at air. Here's our air box. Air comes in, goes in through a filter. We don't take that off as part of our pre or daily inspection, but you can have a look inside and actually see if there's been a wasp nest or any contamination that's got in. Remember, this is straight, direct, natural air. So whatever's you've flown through is going in there. Uh, there's the head of that bird I found earlier. So we need to look at that. So we need air and fuel to make this engine run. So this is where we get our air source from. This is a, a ICP um, manufactured air box certified for this aircraft. And you'll see here is our hot air, cold air vent. Okay, we can check that by coming back into the aircraft and actually looking at the operation of that vent. We can also check our choke through our choke system by pulling our choke cable. And again, cables here in a carburetor are no different to a rudder cable or any control cable. Check, feel, look, determine the fixing, make sure they're correctly assembled. There's our throttle return spring. This is why we have throttle creep. We have a return spring so that if the throttle was, cable was to break, the aircraft will always go to full power. It's a standard design feature for aircraft engines. So there's our, our spring, that's what we want to see in place. We can always shut it down at full power, but we can't make it go if the throttle's broken. So once we go past our carburetor, we then move into our intake manifold, and our intake manifold goes into the actual head. It mixes with spark created from the electrical system. So now's a good time to talk about our CDIs. Most of our aircraft have got solid state or electronic ignition these days. These are the CDI packs. There were changes that brought out by Rotex. Again, know which ones are affected. And uh, again, with Jabiru, if there's an advisory, know what your CDIs are. CDIs are heat sensitive. They don't like heat. So um, sometimes you'll get a failure, but really all we can look for here is connections and make sure all our connections are okay. We're looking here to make sure that our wiring loom and our harness is in integrated. It follows all the way through. We can have a look at our voltage regulator, our starter solenoid, our main fuse, okay? And all the things that lead up to provide our sparking system that goes in through our electrical system. You'll see these cables are all sheathed and they're actually zip tied appropriately by the manufacturer. Okay, that leads over to our spark plugs. We've, uh, typically we've got a dual spark plug system in most aircraft engines. Okay, we've got two on the top. We're looking at the cap to make sure the cap's integrated. We make sure that the plug's solidly fixed in and there's no blow-by or evidence that there's air or gases coming out of there. We can see hot spots in any of the engine if there's been any leaks, particularly on the exhaust manifold and we feel for the plugs underneath and make sure that they're attached. This is pretty hard to do when the engine's hot, so this is why the daily inspection at the beginning of the day is so important. Okay, again we check the exhaust, moving back down to look at the actual muffler. Checking on Rotaxes particularly, look at our exhaust springs because they do, um, they're a spring steel and they don't like hot cold cycling, so it's not unusual to see a spring broken on a, on, particularly on a Rotax configuration, depending on how it's set up but make sure that they're all intact and they're safety wired. Now some are safety wired, you'll find, um, but um, some aren't. But if they are safety wired, make sure that the safety wires in place and not just floating loosely. Okay, again, we can have a look at our oil filter. We can have a look at our oil cooler. We can check our oil cooler hoses. We can check our gearbox, make sure that the inspection, any of the inspection and nuts are fine. Have a look at our propeller hub. Really important to check the backing plate for the propeller because we can see that from inside the engine bay. We're looking for any cracking. Obviously that's just a bit of lubricant, but we're looking to see that there's no cracking in the backing plate. Okay, there's our strobe reference point. 
and this is our um, housing extension unit. So these are all torqued and wired. You'll see that they're safe, correctly safety wired. Okay, so from there we'll move around to the other side of the engine. Not a lot to see different on the other side, but we haven't covered coolant. So we're just going to cover that quickly. Our cooling system comprises basically a water pump, which is hidden in the back of the engine. Our um, cooling radiator, which is right down the bottom. And our coolant hoses that feed into the engine. So we check the coolant system, make sure that there's no issues. Our coolant overflow bottle in this aircraft is hidden right down in here. It's very hard to see, um, and it's sometimes easy to see from under the aircraft, but it's a, it's a small 600mm um, reservoir bottle. It's a closed system to make sure that our coolant can suck coolant in and suck coolant out. Of course, it all comes into this centre point here, which is where our radiator cap is. Generally for an inspection we won't remove the radiator cap, but as part of our 25 hourly or 50 hourly we'll take that out, check the coolant, make sure the cap's okay, and we'll actually do a pressure test on the system probably once every year as part of an annual service. Okay, check all our hoses are intact, make sure that's okay. Now the only other one we haven't covered is the oil system. So we're going to talk about the oil system now. In the Rotax we run an external oil supply, so the catch tank is separate, we don't have an inbuilt crankcase where or oil sump where we actually draw the oil it's separate it's in here okay this is where all the blood of our engine lives so this is the oil, this is the oil tank it feeds via the oil reticulation system back in via an oil pump and feeds in and then cools via the oil cooler which is at the front of the aircraft and then circulates oil through the engine this is our oil dipstick it's important when we check it, and it's good to move away from the aircraft so it won't spill oil. Hold it horizontally so we can actually assess the level. I always like to get an idea where it is, and then we, if for a daily inspection, I take the oil cap off. I put it in a place where I'm never going to forget to put it on. I don't hide it down here in the engine. If I had brakes on or chock the wheels, I'd chock them. I check my ignitions are off. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to burp the Rotax. And in burping the Rotax, what we're doing is we're rotating the propeller, which is turning the gear-driven oil pump, to actually determine the true quantity of oil. So any oil that's remaining in the bottom of the engine gets returned back to the oil reservoir, where we can actually ascertain the correct level of the oil. How do we turn a propeller? Look, it's a dying art, and I say that <laughs> literally, because if you do it the wrong way, there's a good chance you'll end up um, maybe an arm or a leg less, but treat every propeller like it's live. We've always walked around it in the pre-flight inspection, treat it as live. Three-bladed propellers are really easy to turn, and we can turn them from the back. The old method of starting is to here and pull back with an Armstrong swing, but in our propeller, I like to be behind it. If we're behind it and it, it does start, then the threat's gonna go away from us. But when we turn it, however, we still turn it the same way. We're pulling the prop through away. So if that was to fire, it's only gonna fire in the direction it would, it would normally be timed and, and travel. If it fires, we're going away from the danger. So when we turn the propeller, grab the face of the blade, pull it through, and a little tip with Rotax is if you hold it on the compression stroke, you actually build crankcase pressure and force the oil through quicker. So less is more. If you hold the propeller just at the compression stroke for a few seconds, you'll find that the oil will reticulate back to the return reservoir faster. So there, pull through, grab the next blade, and you'll get three or four compression strokes. only ever turn a Rotax four stroke in the direction of rotation, never contrary to the rotation. Because of the hydraulic valves, it's really important we don't introduce an airlock into the system. Excuse me, I burped. There's our Rotax burping. Now I didn't work up a sweat turning that prop, I think I turned it about five or six times and that was enough with the pressure I generated on each stroke to push the oil that was in the bottom of the engine back to the reservoir. One or two burps is acceptable. If you get one, try and keep that pressure because the fluid will try to move backwards. And you'll find the second burp will come fairly quickly. 
there we go. So two or three mil turns. If what we're looking for now is consult the manufacturer's book, but we're looking for somewhere between a half and full, we don't want to see it when we burped it not up into that flat surface area. Rag please sir. <laughs> Always good to have a rag on standby. So that's where we're looking for the oil and generally between a half and the top. We don't want to see it over full. Okay, we just turn the engine into an oil refinery. But that's where we want to see it. Now, dip stip goes back in. An important note when we put, check the seal, again, just like we did with our fuel tanks. When we put it on, there's two fingers in here. Make sure when we put it on, we put it in flat and it's a quarter of a turn. Don't force it because it's easy to bend these things, okay? Put that on, check it, see it, visualize it, confirm it. If you remove anything in the engine process, double check that you've put it back the right way. And if you've got a tool, make sure it doesn't sit there. Keep it away where you know that you're not going to leave it and forget it in the engine bay. I've seen many a rag sucked into an air intake for that reason. Okay, have we missed anything? Probably need to have a look at our engine mounts, have a feel for our overall integrity of the engine mounting. We can do that by pushing, having a look down deep in the engine, looking for any movement. And other than that, I think we covered the voltage regulator. Have a look at the firewall. It's a good idea to have a look at your firewall here because all the, this is the dividing for, for, between the engine. It's where the engine mounts attach to. Make sure we've got no cracks. Make sure we've got no propagation in any of the mounting surfaces that control the throttle arms. So, so on. Again, have a look at any of your electrical connections. You'll see down here we've got a temperature probe connection. We're looking to make sure that that's attached. And again, this side we'll do the same as the other side. Check our fuel hoses, our carburetor, check our choke cable and our throttle cables. So just when we're talking about the engine itself, the important part is the cylinders and the overall cases of the engine. We're really looking for signs of cracking or stressing from through bolts, depending on the engine type, to the actual heads, right to the rocker covers, looking for oil weeping or leaks, and you can feel for that. But have a good close look at the where the barrels attach to the actual engine case and also have a look at the through bolt connections and make sure they're not and sometimes even grab them by your hand because you can spin a through bolt and it might be broken halfway through. Really important to check those. Again, pretty hard to do when it's hot but really important to do as part of that first morning daily inspection. Okay, and that applies throughout the engine. Have a look at the actual, the core of the beast if you like and make sure it's solid. Really important to spend your time on the engine. Um, as I said, we're a glider after if we don't have this right. Okay, and that's pretty much the engine. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our pre-flight inspection or our daily inspection, depending on what we were doing for this flight. We've covered a fair bit. You can see the principles we've applied, the three C's, and you can see that we've broken the whole process up into a number of different aspects. In no way does a daily inspection or a pre-flight inspection substitute or replace a periodical inspection that's been designated by the manufacturer in the operating handbook. I want to make that clear. What we just did is not an interval inspection. It's just a daily inspection to make sure the plane is fit for flight. Did we find anything wrong? Because that's really what we wanted to find. We assumed that there was something wrong with this plane today and we were looking really hard to find it. If we didn't find it, then we've succeeded in making sure that as pilot in command, we've actually got an aircraft that's airworthy to fly it. So as a line maintenance privilege holder, I've got the ability to actually sign out that aircraft fit for flight as pilot in command for the day. So armed with our flight record, we're actually going to now sign this aircraft out to say that the daily or pre-flight inspection has been completed in accordance with technical manual and manufacturer's requirements. And we are now good to go.